How many of you have been to your doctor in the last year for a general checkup? Good. So how many of you know your cholesterol? Good. And your blood pressure? Excellent. Okay. How many of you know your brain health? <laughs> Some of you raise your hands. Um, so tell me how you know your brain health. Well, I haven't had studies. Okay. I've had recent studies. I've had a CT scan recently. Okay, so you had a scan that says something about your brain health. Is that what you're thinking? Well, okay. I'm thinking maybe Good. Good, okay. So people say they have good brain health because they had a scan, which is important, I think, if you take a look at the brain and it's looking okay. But there's so much more to it than that. And so I'm just going to talk about what you all can do. But before I get to that place, I think that I want to give you a little bit of a background. So I'm, think of this as two parts. One really boring kind of science-based kind of stuff that gives you gives me the reason to stand up here and say to you that I think I know what's going on. And then the rest about what you can do and how um, actually um, our cardiovascular folks have been leading the way. Um, so when we think about getting older, the thing that I think is causes the most concern is the idea that Alzheimer's disease or dementia, <coughs> right? People are worried. I think that they did a poll a while ago of uh, people in my generation, the baby boomers. The f their number one fear was cancer. Their number two fear was Alzheimer's disease. Their number three fear was the cardiovascular health. So dementia has moved up to number two. As they get older, I think that's going to get a little higher <laughs> priority. But um, so um, I think it's, it, you know, it's a concern for all of us, right? Um, but the other thing that people don't pay too much attention to or take a little bit is that right behind that and having a very similar pattern is stroke, okay? So stroke is actually, um, I think, it's the number one cause of disability in older individuals. It is not the number one cause of death, okay? Heart disease still ranks as number one, I believe. And what's interesting about this is that when you sort of begin to look at this is what you see is that heart disease begins even in, in a recognizable proportion of our population in the 30s and 40s. So there are people who have heart disease in the 30s and 40s, and it goes up. But more importantly, that even in a group like this, there's a fair number of people who have hypertension, which is the number one risk factor for um, heart disease, okay? So while we talk about Alzheimer's disease and we're concerned about that we also have these things that we're concerned about for our heart, okay? And in fact, <coughs> when my colleague, Suda Sishadri, looked at the likelihood that you're gonna have a stroke or the likelihood you're gonna have a dementia when, at age 65, okay? So you got your Medicare notice and you're ready to go and you're gonna get in your boat or on your RV and everything looks great. Um, then what you see is that, in fact, for women, the likelihood of having a stroke or dementia are almost equal by the time you get to 80. For men, it's actually you're more likely to have a stroke, okay? And why do I make this point is because these two are very common diseases, okay? Particularly among people who are getting older, okay? And so the question is, how do these two actually interact when we're talking about things that you can do for your health, your brain health, okay? And how does that differ from some drug for Alzheimer's disease, okay? And why am I making that distinction is because right now we have four FDA-approved medications for Alzheimer's disease none of which actually modify the course of the disease, okay? And I think most of you who have some experience know that and understand that. We have probably 200 medications for vascular disease, almost all of which modify the course of vascular disease. So the question is, 
wow, we want to cure Alzheimer's disease, I think it's really important. We want to do that. I'm, I'm not denying the importance of that. But is there anything else we can do in the meantime? And what would be the rationale for even trying to do anything else? Okay? And one of the rationales that's really <laughs> important is that um, Mia Kivapelto, uh, quite a few years ago now, 2006, almost uh, 12 years ago, more than a decade ago, noticed that in Finland, when she looked at individuals in midlife, because they have, in Finland they have a very nice health record system, she noticed that there were some things that were associated that increase, increased your lifetime risk for getting dementia. And then she came up with this score, this risk score. Well, um, Rachel Whitmer, who is now a member of our faculty and is now in the Alzheimer's Disease Center, looking at the Kaiser Health System, duplicated those results. And what, she sh what they both showed in two different populations, which, you know, I'm the kind of person, you can tell me that the sky is blue, but I'm going to ask somebody else. And for those of you who know me well enough, <laughs> look, Jane is shaking her head. I, it helps if I have three other people agreeing and confirming it, okay? Um, so, um, I like to see this kind of confirmation, and I also like to see this kind of confirmation in two different populations, okay? So I think that's really helpful. And what you see in this is that there are a couple of things that's, that are important, and that is, this is a scale you want to, this is, this is a scale you want to be like on golf, okay? You want to get a low score, right? So <coughs> this, things go up in terms of as you get um, older, things go down if you have better education. These are two things that we know about. Um, men, um, you have higher risk, um, although there's some other stuff that's going on there, and I don't want to get into it too much. But that's on that side. But then look at this. Cholesterol, your body mass index, which is a, a measure of your weight, obesity, and your blood pressure. All of these things are vascular risk factors, okay? Are there risk factors for vascular disease, okay? And the important point, and I like to do this, see this, is that as your score goes up, the likelihood of you getting dementia also goes up, and the two go up in a very, what we call, linear way, okay? So with each increment, your risk goes up, okay? So at least a few of these things you can modify, right? You can always modify your age, but we really don't want to. And you, actually, you can modify your education. And this is, t but you know, your biological sex is what you've been given when you were uh, born. Another th set of studies, of which one of which um, Dr. Whitmer did participate in as well, actually said in a completely different way of looking at the same problem. It just said, if I ask somebody, do you have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, are you overweight, do you smoke, blah, 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 blah. When you're 40 years old, what happens to you when you're 75 or 80, okay? And she could do that very nicely because she had looked um, at the registry from the Kaiser Hospital System, okay? And she showed that if the number of vascular risk factors that you have, the likelihood that, you, that you're going to increase, increases the likelihood that you're going to become demented in later life. Um, one of the important points that I put on here is that the Kaiser Hospital System is a majority uh, uh, Caucasian system, okay, health system. Same thing, though, was seen in the um, uh, uh, north side of New York. Um, and what they showed, though, is that, that, that even with just three risk factors, in a group in which was mostly um, non-Caucasian, the risk went up similarly, so they looked pretty similar, but the number at the top, it's higher. So, and this reflects the fact, and I'll show you some other data about this in a minute, reflects the fact that vascular disease is more common in our non-Caucasian populations. So the Latinos and African Americans in particular um, have a higher likelihood of having hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterolemia, and that's probably an interaction between genes and environment. So we have these, we have these population-based studies that looked at, created this score and it had to do with vascular disease, then we have these 
epidemiological studies that just took these samples and found the same thing. So it suggests that vascular disease is important. Well, why is that, why is, what does that even mean, okay? Um, does it play a role in the brain, okay? And um, one of the things that hasn't been done a lot, or not nearly enough, are studies of community-based populations in which individuals in the community donate their brains as part of research, and then we take a look at what, how that affects their thinking, okay? Um, and a, a proponent of this who, uh, who uh, started this uh, almost 20 years ago, David Bennett, and brought in a neuropathologist, Julie, Julie Snyder, started collecting, uh, did a community study and started collecting um, autopsies on a wide spectrum of individuals, okay? Very healthy, very well-educated people, but also people in the community who are of average um, educational achievement, average socioeconomic status, and in fact mixed in terms of some of their ethnic background, particularly African American. So what they found is that when you look at their little pie chart here, is that Alzheimer's disease was a lot of the, the actual disease in the brains of these individuals who died with dementia. So Alzheimer's disease, there was a, a lot of it, okay? Makes sense, all right? Because we're worried about Alzheimer's disease, we know it happens, okay? But what they noticed is that absolutely pure Alzheimer's disease, and now the average age of these people was about 80, 85, is that little aqua thing that says 3%, okay? 3% of people had pure Alzheimer's disease, okay? What this chart doesn't show you, and what the next one will show you, is that, in fact, the amount of coincident vascular disease, that is, it was present in the brain, but see, now it's pink, and that's the, all the diseases in which there was also vascular disease present, okay? So here's what I'm trying to build this little story, right? I'm building a little story, because I like to be a storyteller. So my story starts with, well, we know that there's, there's Alzheimer's disease, we know there's stroke, they know those two things happen together. Then when we look at risk factors for dementia, all of which looks like Alzheimer's disease, by the way, okay, it looks like classic, we see that the, the risk factors also share vascular disease. And now I'm saying, hey, wait a minute, vascular disease is in the brain. So maybe if we could get rid of the vascular disease, maybe we'd do a little bit better, and that's part of the premise but before I get to that piece, I gotta tell you a little bit more, and here's the boring sign so you can all walk out and come back when you're done. Um, so the point is, is that, wait a minute, I, I said to you that you're likely to have stroke, but you know, most of the people who are demented don't have stroke, okay? And the reason is that stroke is just the tip of the iceberg of vascular disease that injures the brain, okay? And there's ways you can look with imaging at other things that are, we call silent brain injury, uh, one of which is um, looking at small strokes in the brain that um, are, they have no symptoms associated with it, okay? They're just little tiny holes in the brain, okay? The other is this fluffy white stuff that we call white matter hyperintensities. And um, if you've ever had an MRI and you're above the age of 55, there'll be something that the radiologist will read and say it's like microvascular disease or something like that, okay? And that's a very common finding. Well, we can count the little white spot holes. We can also actually um, measure the absolute amount. So where the white in the fluffy white turned to yellow, that means I can count that and measure it. And then we can just ask how common is this in a population? Because if we're gonna say that vascular disease had anything to do with anything, we got to know how prevalent it is, right? How common it is, okay? So, this is from the Framingham Heart Study. This was published uh, 12 years ago, too. Um, I assure you, Mia got much more press for hers than I did for mine, but that's okay. I'm not jealous. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, anyway. <laughs> so, Here's the strokes in men, women, and on average. And what we're saying in decade of life, so if, if, you're 80, if you're in your eighth decade of life, you're 70 years old, 
from 71 to 79. So by the time you're in your 70s, about 15 to 17 percent of the population has little holes in their brain. So about 15 percent of the population at age 75 or so, so that's one out of six, about, okay, um, have these small little strokes, okay? They don't do anything that we can see, but they represent something that's going on in your body. And it goes up, it continues to go up as you get older, okay? And I won't bore you with this, but the yellow means that it's significant, and all I can tell you is that the risk factors that we were talking about for stroke and the risk factors for dementia are the same risk factors for those silent strokes that you see in your brain, okay? So they share it. Um, it means to me that those people who have those things have those same risk factors for dementia, okay? Those white, fluffy white things, they go up as you get older. So you can see this little cartoon showing how they go up as you get older in the amount, and this little graph shows that same thing. Um, so that an average 80 to 90 year old has about 10 cc's, which is less than the shot of whiskey I'd like to have right now. <laughs> and then, though, the important point is that there seems to be an interaction. So as we get older, you see how the spots go up like that? They increase a lot. Well, that happens to be because as we get older, there's a certain part of the percentage of the population has hypertension, diabetes, and um, high cholesterol, so they have more of these risk factors, okay? And again, the same stroke risk factors that we talked about in earlier, risk factors for stroke, risk factors for dementia, are the risk factors for those little white spots. Last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll be done with science, I promise you, um, is um, when we look at our brains, right? We talk about atrophy. We talk about shrinkage of the brain with the age. Uh, some of you probably have uh, uh, heard, heard my little talk about how the brain shrinks as we get older, right? Okay. Well, it shrinks at a certain rate, okay? Before we started doing our research, sad to say, 1991, um, nobody thought that, that vascular disease, we, everyone thought shrinkage of the brain was due to Alzheimer's disease. But we began to notice that shrinkage of range can happen with hypertension. And so my colleague, Suda Sisadre, and I, working again in the framing hem heart study, said, OK, let's look at a summary score that tells us about those risk factors, just like uh, Dr. Kiva Pelto and Dr. Whitmer's risk score for dementia. What does that do to your brain? And it turns out that if you have a lot of these risks, OK, your brain is about 4% smaller than if you have virtually none of these risks, okay? And you say, 4%, <laughs> shucks, that's no big deal. I mean, that's, that's less than a tax bracket change, right? Um, I, could, I could deal with that. Well, it turns out that's 20 years of aging, okay? So that's a lot. And it, I don't want to bore you with the details, but it has that blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking are all part of that, risk factors, and that actually, you can't tell, it's a little hard to read this graph, but those two kind of greenish lines are if you have these higher risk factors, and you can see, not only are they going down like this, but they're curving, which means that the effects are beginning to accelerate, okay? So your brain shrinkage gets a little bit quicker as you get older. Now. You could say, okay, I did all these fancy measures, and in fact, when I first presented this data, one of my colleagues who became a good friend of mine said that I was making up diseases using computers, which was pretty fun. <laughs> um, maybe true, but so is it clinically relevant? And the answer is yes. So same Framingham group. We just asked a simple question. If you have a bunch of that, if you have one of those strokes in your brain, what's the likelihood you're going to become demented in eight to 10 years? It's a big deal. Changes quite a bit. Now, those numbers are really, really small, OK? So this is incident. That means you're going to develop new dementia. And so incidence is very small. So this is eight per 1,000 people, OK? So it's not a lot, but that's every year, OK? So that's, that's a big risk, OK? The same thing with that white fluffy stuff. It increases your risk for being demented. This is the way I sort of conceptualize it. And that is, is that we have these things 
we're calling vascular risk factors, and they're beginning early in life, and they kind of add up over time. Okay, so if you just take this group and we brought in some college students to kind of young it down, or if we look in the back and see some young people and we ask them, the prevalence of these, these vascular risk factors will be really low, and then we get a middle-aged group and they'd be a little higher, and they get the rest of us and they'd go up, okay? And so this is happening way back when, okay? And then it's doing something very subtle to the brain, okay? It's not doing, it's not causing to have stroke, but it's doing some subtle things. And all of this is happening way before the first protein of Alzheimer's disease is forming in your brain, okay? And so the way I kind of think about this is, well, let me summarize it and then I'll show you. So, in summary, we have these vascular risk factors. They're common as we get older. They do injure the brain. Most of the time, you're not aware it's happening, right? It's very subtle. It doesn't affect your activities of daily living. It doesn't, it doesn't lead you to, to be grossly forgetful. But then the question is, what happens when you get Alzheimer's disease? Because these two things seem to come out together, right? Is it setting you up? And this is the way I sort of think about it in terms of how, so in kind of a graphic form, if we have our ability as we get, as we develop, okay, we hit some maximum level ability, okay? And it used to really be in the 20s, but uh, now I'm sort of scooting it to the right, and by the time I hit 70, it's going to be all the way over here, but that's okay. So, you, you know, you hit some peak around your 30s or 40s of your, your abilities, and then things start to dwindle a little bit, okay? Part of that may be related to that there's some pathology in your brain, some silent pathology in your brain. So, the argument might be is if we could reduce that injury to your brain, maybe you would do better. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, can we do that? I said to you when I started this, we don't have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, right? But I said to you, we can modify vascular risk factors. Didn't I say that? You're gonna hold me to it, right? Okay, it was the three of diamonds. Remember that there, no. <laughs> It's a magician's joke. Okay, and so I'm going to show you some magic, okay? So this is, this is the uh, uh, National Health Survey done um, years and years ago, but has been continued for quite some time. And basically what they did is they looked at people at different times in the, our history, starting in 1960, going to uh, 1991. Okay, and they just simply went around and they measured their blood pressure, okay? And they asked a simple question, what to happen to our blood pressure as a population, okay? And what you see is in that gray, there's a little circle there. I like the boxes, it's just easier to look at, okay? Um, so that you can see that, that that's where you had bad blood pressure. So the gray box is way over here, then the red box is a little closer over here, the black box is a little closer over here, and then that little blue box, okay? All right, they're all moving to the left. So those blood pressures, as a population, our blood pressure is going down, okay? Which is good, right? We all know that. And in fact, it's a little hard to read this again. I, I apologize to you all, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I'll just explain it, is that just two millimeters of change on the population level, so that's a, something to keep in mind, okay? Not for your individual, but on a population level, reduces stroke by 6%. Reduces heart disease by 4%, okay? Goodness gracious, if we get to five, look at these numbers, okay? And I'm gonna show you some other numbers that are really impressive. So what we have managed to do is move the needle, and it's already had some health consequences as a population, right? Well, it gets more impressive 
because I told you that was up to 1990. If you pick up from 1990 and you go to 2004, so 10 years later, you see that that stuff is continuing to happen. And in fact, what we see is that there's almost a 25% reduction in heart disease, stroke, um, and high blood pressure. Or the better way to say it is the high blood pressure stuff is, has been going down and these consequences have been going with it, okay? Um, right along with uh, high, blood, um, high cholesterol, okay? And so what we're saying here is that we can move the needle on these, these common problems, okay? So um, Christine Yaffe, who will be talking with you in, in August, <laughs> um, was one of the people with her colleague Deborah Barnes who came up with an idea, said, okay, if we could reduce these vascular risk factors that Mia Kivifelto and Rachel Whitmer talked about that increase your risk for dementia, if we were to reduce those, make them go, reduce them or make them go away, what would happen, okay? And it turns out that you see the number of AD cases, so Alzheimer's dementia cases, in the United States, if you, um, if you add up all these things, either a 10% reduction, which is pretty minimal, in other words, your blood pressure is 10% controlled, better controlled, or your cholesterol is 10%, more, 10% of the population has their cholesterol in normal range, et cetera. And of course, if we get a little bit more active, um, that 500, uh, for the 10 percent, it's 200,000 less cases of Alzheimer's disease in the United States. If you get a 25 percent reduction, they propose that you get 500,000 less cases of Alzheimer's disease. So that has the potential to have a big impact, right? Okay, hold that in your heads because. So, along came Don, uh, Donald uh, Lloyd-Jones. He's a, a cardiovascular epidemiologist at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. Really smart guy. I, you know, I'm one of his fans and he doesn't even know me, which is kind of cool. Um, but so, um, I wrote him once though, just to tell him how great I thought and never got anything back. I, <laughs> spurned. <laughs> um, so he came up with this idea and he was working with the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association and he came up with this idea of what we have now called Life Simple 7. Okay? Okay? And what he came up with is a scoring about how well do us as a population ideally control seven simple factors in our life, okay? So smoking, so ideal control of smoking is you never smoked or you quit over a year ago, okay? You get a point, so this is a point, again, we're back to golf, you wanna, uh, actually, um, sorry, it's the other way around, this is bowling, sorry. You want, you want two points. You want to get as many points as you can, right? So, um, you're, you never smoked, you get two points. Former smoker, um, less than a year from the time that this is being calculated, you get one point. If you're still smoking, you're not doing so well. And you go down this, okay? But what's important is it's smoking, health diet score. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I have a little thing here in just a minute about that. Physical activity. Um, you notice four, greater than or equal to four bouts per week of intense physical activity, okay? I'm gonna separate this, I'm gonna parse this sentence. Sufficient to work up a sweat, okay? I can work up a sweat walking in from the, uh, <laughs> the, the parking lot. So actually, that's what they want you to do, okay? So don't imply whatever your interpretation of, of intense physical, just get a sweat, okay? Um, body mass index of less than 25 kilograms per uh, meter squared, 
That's, a, that's pretty rigorous. Many of us are not even anywhere near that. I have some issues about using the BMI, but the idea is not to be grossly overweight. Um, blood pressure, we, we can talk about that. Total cholesterol and um, your sugar, your fasting sugar. So you want it to be less than 100, okay? And then it goes up like this, okay? Um, and so that's your, that's the Life Simple 7. Trust me, I'm gonna come back to this, so. I don't, you don't have to worry about writing it down right this minute. And I will quiz you later, though. Okay, few words about diet. And here's, here's Charlie's w word about diet from the beginning. And you will have, no, we're not talking, we don't have anybody talking about diet this. Oh, Jack is going to talk to you about what McDonald's does to your bloodstream, so. Um, but last year we had, we, we've had a couple of times, we've had a couple of speakers who have been really very good about what is a balanced diet. Uh, Dr. Rudsley is just, just going to talk to you about what does an unbalanced diet do to you, okay? Um, but so the important point is, is that, the, that your dietary habits are almost always mediated toward through your weight, okay? This is the most important thing. And that this second sentence is really, really critical. And that is, is that it's based on the food you eat, not the supplements that you're taking or the nutrients in the foods. It's actually the food you eat. I can't tell you how many people I know who say, I'm, a he I'm healthy, I take my supplement every day. And then you look at the rest of their diet and he's like, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's actually what you eat not what you take in terms of supplements or other nutrients. And then, I think this idea of if you're gonna have a diet habit, don't make it so complicated that you have to go to a, a, a map on the wall every time you go to eat, you know. Um, so, um, what Donald Lloyd Jones came up with was what's called the DASH diet. And this had to do with, uh, came out of the hypertensive and kidney literature about trying to reduce salt in your, in your diet. But it turns out it's a pretty dang good diet, okay? And fruits and vegetables, fish, um, we're gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about this because um, some argue that you don't need quite as much fish, uh, but you certainly need fish. Fiber-rich whole grains, okay? And Cheerios is great as long as they're not chocolate and full of sugar. Um, and then, of course, the sodium less than 15 grams a day, which actually, be surprised how much sugar and salt are in the foods, particularly processed foods, pre-processed foods that we get. And then, I, this is really very clear, this data is getting more and more clear, and that is sugary be uh, uh, beverages. So, uh, I cannot tell you how many times I go to the Starbucks and, you know, let me tell you. Look at the way I dress. What do you think I'm, what do you think I'm drinking in, in, at Starbucks? Black. I'm just black straight up coffee, okay? All right, but man, there's this macchiata stuff like, and all I'm thinking is sugary drinks, sugary drinks, sugary drinks, okay? I mean, and they come in different, f and the energy drinks, oh my gosh. How many grams of sugar is in an energy drink? You might as well just take a Hershey's bar about this big. <laughs> okay? Okay? So they're not good for you, okay? Um, what, you do no what you notice here, actually, is that while Fish has talked about what's not on here, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you, I'll get back to that in just a minute, is he doesn't, Donald Lloyd Jones doesn't care if you eat steak or chicken, okay? As long as you eat some fish, all right? So the, so the steak and potatoes people in the audience, great. Now, he does say, if you're going to eat the steak, okay, all right, don't make a chorizo, kielbasa, or my favorite is the hot dog. <laughs> I don't even know what's in a hot dog, and I don't want to know. <laughs> The other thing that he says are, are nuts, legumes, and seeds. So, you know, those are also very good for you, and they're a great snack, okay? 
they actually, it turns out, they have a, quite a bit of calories, just so you know, um, but they're better for you. Now, there are other diets. And the one you probably heard the most about is the Mediterranean diet, right? How many of you have heard about the Mediterranean diet? Yeah, okay. So the Mediterranean diet does, kind of does things a little bit differently. Um, they have, a, um, they have a, a food pyramid that looks nothing like the U.S. food pyramid, by the way, uh, which is at the top that um, the red meat is really should only be in, ingested two to three times a month, okay? Um, that um, poultry can be done um, uh, more often. Fish should be done um, two to three times a day, okay? Um, yeah, it's a lot. Um, so there's lots of stuff here that we don't generally do. And the other thing that we kind of shy away from, and those are not supposed to be donuts, by the way. <laughs> but they're Th but they're their kissing cousin, and those are bagels, which I really like a lot. Uh, but anyway, so whole grain kind of things, including pasta, which is interesting. But um, I think that they would say that the pasta is mixed with um, uh, tomato sauce and not uh, cream. Um, but anyway, it shows this. And the other thing that they don't talk about and is how much water you drink. So we all should be drinking um, 10 um, to 12 eight ounce glass uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. I have to, but that's a different story. So I ha I, I'm, I'm conscript conscripted to do that. Um, and then the glasses of wine, one to two glasses of wine. Now, everybody says, oh, goody, goody. <laughs> um, it's, generally, it's generally suggested you do this with a meal and not, you know, open up a bottle of port and just chug it down. <laughs> Okay, um, and then to walk 7,500 steps a day. I don't know how the walking got into the diet. I think that's just somebody trying to make you feel good. Um, Martha Claire Morris, who was here about three years ago, I think. Yeah, about three years ago, actually has come up with a very specific diet that looks very much like the Mediterranean diet with some slight tweaks that is designed for brain health, okay? And so um, Martha Claire's diet is called the MIND diet. It has very similar things, but what she does is she flips this. So she says, you know, eat some green leafy vegetables every day. Eat some nuts every day. Try to eat berries, okay? Um, and then she eats the beans and, the, and the, um, the legumes. She tries to get it every other day, whole grain, three servings a day, fish at least once a week, and then um, poultry at least twice a week. Okay, so she gives it, she just flips this um, to give you the uh, order in which she thinks is more frequent. Okay, now, let's talk about what does this, what does this Life Simple 7 do for you, okay? And how well are we doing on Life Simple 7? You think, by the word simple, that it would be simple to be part of Life Simple 7, okay? Well, so again, um, my, uh, actually he's part of the regard study. I don't know why I don't have him up there. But anyway, um, that, we, they, that um, a group of individuals just simply asked the question, how does this relate to the region, reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke, called the regard study? I'm going to show you a picture a little bit about the geographic differences. It will come as a bit of a surprise to you, but then you'll also have a great sigh of relief because of where you live. But, so, if you add up those scores, okay, if you add up all the scores on everybody, how well do they do I ideally? Now, really, you want to be bowling a seven, right? Okay? Or higher, right? Seven or higher, right? Um, well, the good news is there's almost nobody who's so sick they, that they're, they're, they're awful in everything, okay? Uh, the bad news is there's, no, there's nobody who's perfect, okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Most of the people are sitting around the middle. That means that some of them have uh, what I would say remedial or remediable things that they could do to modify it, to make their health more ideal, okay? The other thing is, is that our black colleagues tend to do a little bit more poorly on this score, 
okay? It's actually significantly more poorly. And that has to do with the simple facts that the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol are higher in, in, in um, our African American population. That's just a reality, uh, which means that if you're going to think about who's going to benefit the most from any kind of intervention, that's certainly going to be one group, okay? So then they looked at, I just sort of to give you a sense of how many people were involved, almost 18,000 people. So this is a good chunk of folks, because they're going to ask the question, how does their brain health follow their body health? Okay? Right? So I've got this simple seven measure, went around, got the simple seven measure on everybody, and they said, what's going to happen to their brains? Okay? How well are their brains going to work? So they followed them. Um, they were all free of stroke and dementia. So, again, those clinical symptoms that I talked to you about, right? They didn't have any of that, okay? Um, and they were followed every uh, couple of years, and they had a memory and a fluency test. That's not really important, but it's just a, these are very simple measures of your thinking, okay? And then they defined impairment. Okay, by saying, if I take a bunch, 100 people, okay, and if you're the, in the group of 25 that's below the mean, then that's a problem, okay? And that's how they defined it, okay? And they did it in a way that you had to really be abnormal on a bunch of different tests, okay? So all their tests. They gave, I know they didn't give very many, but they, they really made it so we're not goofing around here. You got to do poorly on them. Now, remember, if I give, if I was just to throw out a quiz right now, okay, some people wouldn't do so well, all right, just because they're anxious. Some people aren't very good test takers, okay? That's well and good. But actually, what we find is that over time, that if that's your issue, then your anxiety goes away after you take the same test over and over again, and you look normal. Okay, so these people have been followed for a while. So these are the people where, where we know pretty well that what the performance we're getting is pretty accurate. And this is the results, okay? So overall, this is the likelihood that you would be impaired, okay? So 5%, so that's one out of 20 people, are impaired if their health is not so good. If they're not great on the ideal. Now this is all else taken, so remember, Nobody's looking at Alzheimer's disease here, right? This is just 65, 75, 65 to 70 year olds, or a little bit older, just saying, hey, how's your, how's your heart health? This is what your brain health looks like, okay? And actually, what is kind of, kind of cool is that if you're middling, you do much better, okay? It's, it doesn't, you don't have to be perfect. This is the take home message. You don't have to be perfect here. Okay, and I think this is really kind of cool, is that it doesn't matter if you're black or white, okay? So in other words, even though you're more likely to have a higher score if you're black, if you fall into this, it's gonna protect you just the same way. And there's more and more literature that suggests it's not the color of your skin that makes anything, it's what your numbers and your health parameters look like. Does that make sense? So, then I said about this whole thing about the stroke belt, okay? So if you're outside the stroke belt, okay, this is what it looks like. So actually there's a really nice relationship between how well you do here. But if you're in the stroke belt, ah, something else is going on here. There's something about being in the stroke belt, okay, that has something to do with this. And why do I bring this up is because we're not in the stroke belt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the darker colors are, is the stroke, so this sort of brown is a stroke belt. The white actually is the least prevalent of strokes, so, and you can see California is all white in the, on this map, okay? So, um, and this is very interesting. It probably means that this measure is picking up something about these people who are living in this, but we don't know what it is. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, it still has the same effect, but everybody's doing a little bit more poorly on this. On this. Uh, those people, okay, let me say what I, those people who are doing poorly 
aren't as impaired on average if they live outside, but they're more likely to be impaired if they live inside this area, okay? So it, but the relationship seems to be the same, okay? So it's always better to have ideal, but there's something else going on that's not so good, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. All right, and just to say that it, by and large, it doesn't matter which one of these things you change, okay? By and large, uh, one that I think is really pronounced is that your blood sugar, so if you can get your blood sugars down, it really has a very big effect. Your cholesterol, not so much, and I think that to me actually has to do with the fact that most of our cholesterol lowering medications work to reduce risk that doesn't correlate exactly with the cholesterol level. So if you're on the medication, it's not necessarily that your cholesterol has to be 165, for example, okay? It may be your cholesterol is still 200, but because you're on that medication, there's something about your cholesterol that's better for you. Does that make sense? Okay? But the whole point is, is that diabetes and your weight are really strong effects, okay? Why do I mean that? So. Um, <coughs> When I, see, when I show you this number, so this is 100 and this is 72, what this means is that your, your risk has been reduced 28% by this alone, okay? So that's why, your, this is your risk, so your risk has gone down. One is being that you have regular amount of risk, the other being less than regular likelihood, okay? And the point being is that it, it doesn't, you don't have to go from zero to 14. You don't have to change everything. If you work on a few things, that will also have an effect. Does that make sense? Okay, good. That was the message I wanted to get. Um, okay, so this is a nice study that we, uh, we did, and, and, and Matt Pace is a wonderful young guy who's uh, now um, in Australia. Um, Basically, we asked a simple question. Again, just like the regard study, we looked at the Framingham individuals, just like they looked at 18,000. Well, we only looked at about 3,000, okay? So it's a smaller group, but we just asked how many people had really lousy control and how many people had really good control. And we just, we just used the zero to seven as, you know, you're an ideal in all seven categories. And almost nobody's an ideal in all seven categories. Almost nobody is, is not ideal in all categories, okay? And what we found is that, again, you have a reduction in stroke, which is what you'd expect because this is things about stroke. But also, you have a reduction in all causes of dementia. And in particular, you have reduction in Alzheimer's disease too, okay? So if we've diagnosed you with Alzheimer's disease, and, and in the Framingham Heart Study, they go through a pretty rigorous diagnostic evaluation like you would get in a regular doctor's office, okay? So that means that we, we're, we're actually talking about Alzheimer's disease as the memory loss and all the things that you've known of the 10 warning signs for Alzheimer's disease. So they look like Alzheimer's, and it still improved them. <clears throat> Again, the same point I'm gonna try and make uh, about this is that it's more, so it's doing things that are more than just whether you have a clinical diagnosis, but it's also affecting how well your brain is working as that the yellow is the, uh, and the beauty of the, the Framingham Heart Study is that we can do the ideal, so we can take this simple seven and we've done very careful historical um, uh, recordings of their health risk from the time they were 25 years old all the way through. So we can say, well, if you came in today and I did your testing of your cognitive uh, ability and I looked at your, um, uh, your, your ideal uh, risk score or your simple seven risk score, we see that, yeah, you do a little bit better. But what's more important and more impressive is that you've been doing it for a while. In other words, your, your simple seven ideal health has been going on for a while, okay? And it also seems to have a positive effect on your brain. So your brains are slightly bigger. 
So they're healthier. Your, your brain's theoretically, just like I said, when you get brain loss, that makes you look like you're an older brain for your chronological age. This would mean you have a younger brain for your chronological age. And um, um, Zaldi Tan with the, uh, um, the Framingham actually started to break down some of these things and ask simple questions like, if I ask how often do you exercise, and don't tell you why I'm asking you this question, I'm just asking you how often do you exercise, and even though most of us will lie a little bit about that, those people who did a, a those people who did the best out of, um, on average, out of uh, about the 25 percent, 20th percent on the top, have a much less, if you follow them over time, they're the little check line there, the little dash line, the number of people who are actually getting demented is significantly less than the people who didn't exercise. So this is an example of not only is, does your ideal health improve you, but even certain components have an impact. The other components um, we just haven't looked at, and I think that that will be, um, I think they'll have the same effect. And the other thing that I like about this, too, is that it does the same thing with your brain, okay? So your brain size, bigger. The hippocampus, the, mem the memory organ of your brain, bigger, okay? Now, that doesn't mean it's because you have brain swelling because you did kickboxing as your exercise. <laughs> My youngest daughter calls me out of the blue one day and says, you know, I decided to take up kickboxing. Her father's a neurologist, right? <laughs> Fortunately, she says she's not going to, apparently you can just do the exercises and kick a bag or something like that. So she wasn't actually competing, thank God. So. This information is not just in, you're done, this isn't just coming out, it's not, it's been well known, most of it, okay? Um, and so the, the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association, again, have gotten together, and Phil Gorelick is a, a colleague of mine I've known for many, many years. Um, along with Donald Lloyd-Jones and a few other people have done, been doing this for a while, um, Suda, says Hadri, who's actually done the, one of these talks, and again, Christine Yaffe, who uh, will be here in a few weeks, um, months, um, came together and they said, wait a minute, if this works, maybe we should come up with some idea about how to have optimal brain health. And the idea being is that the heart and the brain are connected, okay? And so I won't get into this too much, but there's a little schema saying that we've got all these positive things about genetics and development, but also we have some environmental exposure, so this isn't going to explain it all. But we have all of this vascular risk factors, too. Okay? And so they're contributing. Okay? So there are many causes of impairment of your thinking as we get older, but vascular disease is some of them. And then they came up with a very large thing of which the individual component up there in the left-hand corner is essentially Life Simple 7. Uh, what they do point out is you can go to www.heart.org and find out what your Life Simple 7 score is. I suspect it's going to be averaging about 10 in this group. Okay, you guys are going to be above average, just so you know. Um, but also, some other ideas about things that we, we have talked about in our, in our health group, and that's pursue cognitive stimulating um, and rewarding activities. But then it gets into some things that are important for us as a health provider. Healthcare um, practitioners need to really start to think about these as modifiable risk factors, assess people for those risk factors, um, assess their thinking. Okay, um, and health systems changing the way they look at people, changing the way they take care of our, our people who have cognitive impairment. And then, of course, because this is such a national problem, this should be influenced by our public health system as well, um, and actually become part of health policy. So again, I show you this, this idea that Coming back to that same idea that maybe if we do this, we'll reduce that. So is there any evidence to date to bring you up to speed 
And this is from Donald Lloyd-Jones again, my, my hero. So he predicts, well, he, started, he wrote this, it's sort of funny, he wrote it in 2010, but he predicted that we would be reducing by 2020, in just a couple of years, by 30% um, various diseases, the stroke, um, heart attacks, et cetera, and that, in fact, these might have long-term outcomes related to thinking, okay? I will tell you <coughs> that these goals have already been met a few years early, um, and if you guys are driving around the city, you've probably seen these billboards. You know, Kaiser Hospital says that we've reduced it by 25% or something like that. Of course they have, because everybody's reduced it by 25%. <laughs> it's okay. That means they're doing at least as well as everybody else. So, I mean, that's important. Um, and then there is some data that suggests that the, num that the rate of increase, not the number of demented people, but the rate of increase may be bending a little bit, too. Okay? So, um, I didn't show that because I don't know that the two are completely tied together yet, but we need to do a lot more research. So, anyway, this is the idea. I think this concept of vascular health, as it relates to your brain, may have a very strong public health. Now, can I say that, that if you have ideal cardiovascular health, you'll never become demented? No, okay? And that's the same thing for cancer. There are lots of things that we can avoid, you know. I, I, you know, you never smoked a, your, a day in your life and you get lung cancer. There's stuff that happens. I mean, I can't, but as a group, you're gonna lower your risk, okay? And that I think this idea about Life Simple 7 is gonna provide us an opportunity as a group of individuals who may be getting a little older, may be coming into risk to it, um, take on as our, our life's goal and see what happens. Maybe we'll do a little bit better. Okay, so here comes the quiz, all right? All right, so Life Simple 7. Number one, don't smoke. If you do, stop. I don't care if you have to cover your body with nicotine patches. I don't, some of you are gonna say, well, what about vaping? I don't know, okay? I don't know. We really don't understand what is in cigarettes that causes heart disease. I think the nicotine does contribute. I just don't know if it's in combination that some more research needs to be done. Watch your weight, okay? Don't watch it go up. <laughs> and again, don't get stuck. Here's my most important thing. Don't get stuck on a specific number, and God forbid, don't go over to the BMI table and say, I'm not 25. Okay, yeah, we don't care, all right? Okay, and I give an example, okay? How many of you know about football? Uh, anybody? Okay, a couple of you, all right. Uh, you know, you look at a, a linebacker in the NFL, 260, 250, six foot eight, six foot three, something like that. BMI, 34%. Are they obese? No, they have about 4% fat, body fat, because muscle weighs a ton. Okay, so watch your weight, but be reasonable about it, okay? Eat a healthy diet, okay? And I really mean that, eat a healthy diet, not just, really change your diet. Um, supplements aren't gonna work, okay? Exercise, now I will tell you that I wear a Fitbit, I will tell you that sometimes I'm doing great. Sometimes I'm not doing so good, okay? Just do it, okay? I believe five minutes a day is more than nothing. And then actually, I believe that it can become addictive um, in a good way, and that so if you're doing a little bit every day, it tends to get easier to do a little bit more, okay? Um, I can tell you that I, I don't feel good if I haven't exercised for three days. Control your blood pressure. Now, there's a lot of talk about what that means. All I'm saying is go to your doctor, get your blood, one, get it checked, two, get it reasonably controlled, okay? Um, <clears throat> control your blood sugar, okay? This, I think, we can have the, that our weight and our blood sugar, we can have the t two biggest impact on, okay? And the way we can do that is through the third exercise, 
Okay, if you're going to reduce your blood sugar, the fastest way to do your, reduce your blood sugar is exercise because muscles love sugar. Okay, our body is set up to absorb sugar into the muscles. Okay, so they love it. Um, and lastly, control your blood cholesterol. And if you do all of these things, man, you'll have a marvelous brain. <laughs> Thank you very much. The uh, AARP monthly magazine just came out and said that uh, Asian Indians are less frequent in getting Alzheimer's, and they said it's a lot to do with the diet, which includes a lot of uh, curry. And they were suggesting that you take turmeric curcumin. You any idea on that? So um, there's been a few small studies that have looked at this that have not been effective. Um, this idea about, in, in India in particular, about a lower prevalence of, uh, of dementia is, was at least initially thought to be true. Um, the data that I've seen more recently, it looks exactly like everybody else, okay? That, uh, you know, you, it doubles every five years in prevalence after the age of 65. Um, so I'm not sure. I love Indian food, so I would encourage everybody to go eat it. Um, I don't think, again, I don't think taking a curry or a turmeric supplement is going to do you any good. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Does a um, family history of Alzheimer or dementia have any prevalence on? So, this is what I say. Um, if you have a family history in a father, mother, sister, or brother, okay, that your lifetime risk or your let me rephrase that, your age-specific likelihood goes up, okay? The problem is, is that it's very hard to know for a specific person what that would be. And by and large, I say, if you have a family history and you know about things that could modify your risk, do them, okay? Now, sometimes it will help, other times it may not, but again, I, I'm only, I mean, the important point here is just to say, a lot of this stuff may not help the individual, but if we're at doing this as a population, it could have a big impact. Are there any studies in pediatric populations or age groups about if they're implementing these seven simple steps at that young of an age yet and have followed them through? Like how, how young are these studies? In yes, yes, so there's the, um, is it the Lothian, Lothian aging study? They did, what they did, a little bit, it's a little bit different, so they haven't, so let me just say that there are studies that have followed kids from eight, eight, eight years old, okay? And um, this was in, uh, oh, I hope I have this right. I don't know if it was in Ireland or, I don't, anyway, somewhere over there in Europe. <laughs> North of, London. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and what they did is they just simply asked the question of how smart were they at eight, eight years old? And then they followed them and what happened to them. It turns out is that if you're smart at eight, you're going to be smarter than, than average um, in, when you're 75. And there's a slight lower rate. What they don't know is are they having health behaviors that are different? And that I think is a critical question. But it also touches on something that our that I'm interested in, which is, um, I showed you that curve where I said, you know, we're thinking about developing the brain and then it meets its maximum. My feeling is, is that there's a lot we don't understand about this brain development outside of, you know, here we are in the Mind Institute, which is a institute for neuro neurodevelopmental disorders, right? So that, um, you know, if you've got something wrong with your brain, we know a lot about it, but the normal brain, how much education, how enriched should be your environment, I can tell you right now, it's more than you'd expect your average Republican would pay for. So, I'm sorry, I just had to say that. Thank you for this talk, this was very informative. Uh, my question is, if someone, if objective findings have seen some small ishmic uh, episodes, and there has been some decline in the brain functioning. Can reaching towards the simple seven ideal numbers yeah, arrest that yeah. decline? So, yeah, 
Yeah, that was a question asked a little bit earlier. So if you have some mild impairment, will these practicing simple seven help you? And the answer is probably. It certainly won't hurt you, and it might help you a little bit. We just don't know how much. I will tell you all, and I've said this once before, so just so you know, that we're one of uh, two sites that are going to be coming out called the Pointer, which uh, Mio Kiva Peltos um, did that study where she looked at those risk factors. She went on and did a study and said, what do you do when you correct those? And she showed that he health intervention does work. We are going to be doing that in 500 people um, who are part of the UCD system. So if you're part of the UCD system and you're interested, you may be hearing from us, okay? You talk about different diets. How do you feel about the ketogenic diet? Ah, uh, this is a really interesting question. Uh, um, so the ketogenic, how do, how do I feel about the ketogenic diet? Okay, the ketogenic diet takes the actually the opposite approach, okay? And that is it says nothing but fat. Yeah, three slabs of butter, awesome. <laughs> Cream, awesome, but you can't have a single carb, okay? And the, and the purpose of this, which is scientifically shown, is that what you're doing is you're shifting your body's metabolism away from glucose to ketones, okay? It makes ketones. Now, ketones are a specific form of energy that the brain doesn't usually use, okay? It doesn't use it unless you're in severe starvation. It certainly has been proven repeatedly to improve abnormal electrical activity in, in seizures. It's a very effective mechanism for reducing seizures, okay? Um, the question is, is there something about the brain sugar metabolism that might benefit from that? And the answer is, we don't know yet, okay? I will just put this in, in perspective. It is a very difficult diet to do. It's very, very hard to, to do it. Um, and, and that's because simply because you, f you don't feel so good. You're acidotic, you're grouchy. Um, so it can be a little bit hard to, to uh, j Hi. just me on, on a bad day. Excuse, excuse me, please. Yes. I have a question. I read an article in the New York Times a week or two ago, and it talked about the missing link has been finalized. This is after 15 years of study, uh, scientists or researchers have linked all the genes together, geno, geno, geno. Wide association studies. Do you know what or, I'm or whole genome sequencing? Yeah, genome, that's it. Whole genome sequencing, yes. And I'm wondering, they were saying they, they can now, they'll be able to cure cancer, heart disease. Uh, what's that one, the, uh, the one where you shake, I don't know, it's the Parkinson's disease. Will this also affect Alzheimer's and dementia, or is this, this still a theory? So. Yeah. Okay. So um, it, it's a really good question. Uh, so the question is, if we knew every gene in your DNA, every gene, every little part of it, would we be able to absolutely determine your risk for every disease under the sun and then be able to intervene and change that risk? And the answer today is no. Okay. And um, that is because there are good recombinations and not so good recombinations. And just knowing what the, so this is, the way I like to think about it is, is that this would be great if you had a high resolution map of New York City, okay? It'd be wonderful, that's better than not having one. But if you're lost on the corner of 27th and 6th and don't know which way to turn, it's not going to help you that much. And this, I think that it will put us in a place where we can begin to understand what I call biological systems, that then we could intervene. But it's not until you get to the bio. I don't think that code, with, with, except with, re, with rare exception, will tell us more than we already know. What it will tell us are which systems are more likely to be involved. And it has already begun to bring in two systems that we haven't talked about today, and that's inflammation and what we call immunity, okay? Um, and so there's some stuff going here, and it's probably going to change the way we think about it. It has certainly revolutionized cancer. It has certainly revolutionized cancer. Because you take a cancer cell, you do a genome scan on the cancer cell, you find out what's wrong, and you might be able to treat it with a drug that you even 
didn't even think about it. The person likes tea and all they had to do is eat, drink coffee and they're cured, okay? I mean, that's really extreme, but what I'm saying is that there are examples in which a drug that would have never been indicated for this particular cancer is given this person based on their genome sequencing and it actually cures them. So I think whether that's going to work for Alzheimer's disease or not, I don't know, but it's certainly going to help health and probably identify some of these things that we can modify. My hope is in the next 10 to 15 years we'll, we'll, we'll see something. If you want to be on track on that, oops, he disappeared, on that subject, you can consider volunteering for the new National Institute of Health 10-year study called All of Us. Yes. And UC Davis is one of the locations that's going to be doing some of the legwork, the measuring, the blood draws. It's DNA rich, and I am here to tell you, because I signed up the minute I saw it advertised, the online assessment all by itself is a fascinating exercise. Yes. So she's All of us. Yes. All of us is a study of one million people. They're hoping to get one million people across the United States who are part of an integrated health system. Um, so you have to be a UCD participant, um, and then they, ex they access your medical records, and they follow you, and then they look at genes, and they ask all these questions, and you may be able to volunteer for certain things. Uh, all of that is completely anonymous. That is, you're going to send that stuff up there, and nobody's going to ask who you are, okay? Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, so do we have any data on the blue zones? Do you know how, how many of you know what a blue zone is? Okay, so blue zone is a place in, in the world, there's, depending on how you do the definition, six or eight of them around, um, where a group of people in that area live on average above 100 years. Okay, so these are, this is longevity at its best, okay? Um, and it, we think it might be lifestyle or it could be an interaction between genetics and lifestyle. Um, and you say, well, wait a minute, you know, the, the, one of the blue zones is in uh, somewhere in California, and I can't, Loma Linda, okay. So, wow. Where are the other seven? Okay, never mind. Uh, I know, I'll stop. Um, so there may be some lifestyle factors there, but it may be the people who chose to immigrate to Loma Linda, okay. Well, you think about it, there's a large Mormon population there. So there could be some genetic influence. Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh okay. You mentioned something about the Alzheimer's protein. Yes. Um, is that, can you see that like before Alzheimer's takes place or after the symptoms have already been there? So um, the answer is that, so the question was, can we see the Alzheimer's protein, the amyloid, the beta amyloid in the brain before you develop Alzheimer's disease? The answer is yes. Um, and UC Davis has been part of a study that's been looking at it. We've been looking at it for years now. Um, what we don't understand is why some people have that protein and never get demented, okay? So not everybody who has that protein gets demented, okay? So it increases the likelihood but it's not a determinant. It's not absolutely, if you have this, you'll get this. So we can, and, we've, and this is where technology has moved to make things, um, I think, uh, a lot more um, specific about how we can talk about the diagnosis, um, but also ways to help us use that as a marker of treatment. 